Okay, it's, uh, it's gone half past, so I think we might as well make a start. Yeah. Um, so, let's, uh, let's do that. So, it's good to see you all, and thank you so much for coming. Have you been blessed so far? So, you know, we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit of time now looking at the sort of stuff that I do. Um, I'm a psychotherapist who specializes in uh, recovery work. Uh, I've been doing it for about the last 30 odd years, uh, 33 I think, coming up to 34 years now. And um, I'm a recovered person myself. Um, yeah, let me get this started. I've, I'm going to put a timer on because the, the difficulty is not getting me to talk, it's getting me to shut up. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to set this because um, let me just set this because I've got three things I want to talk about and um, I'm going to set it to 20 minutes so that we, um, we get the time. Right. So yeah, I, I, um, I, this is a new thing for me to do, um, and so I believe God's going to do a new thing through me, because I do, I, I do um, spend a lot of time teaching in Christian organisations, so I will talk about the scriptural uh, references to my approach and my, my strategy and techniques and stuff, but I've never sort of thought about the biblical uh, foundation of it the principles behind how this approach has developed. So it's a new thing for me today, so bear with me. Uh, and we've only got an hour, so I'm, I'm going to be um, talking just about a couple of things. We're not going to have time to talk about uh, genuine methods and, and techniques that I use. Um, but I want to promise you that if you put down your, your name, your email, uh, on our sheet today uh, and write it clearly, write your name clearly, because uh, we get sort of at gmail.com, you know, you can't, you're not going to get anything through that. But if you write it clearly, then uh, I will send you stuff. And any questions you have that are not answered today, you know, I will engage with you. So we're going to look at what it, what's a biblical view of recovery. Uh, my, my workshop tends to be two days uh, and we don't cover half of this stuff. So, you know, as I said, we haven't got time to go into all of this. But um, I think it's important what a thing is, you know, before you start uh, talking about how to treat it. And you'd be surprised at how many uh, professionals, how many treatment centers and so on, when you ask them, what, what is addiction? What, is it, what do you think it is? You know, they, they, they struggle to answer it. Um, and and uh, so I, I'm very, I, I'm a systemic psychotherapist and we're big on coherence. We're big on keeping it simple and, and being clear to set a context. So um, I call addiction an inappropriate relationship. Okay, so it sort of goes beyond the medical model to some extent. Um, and I think that's kind of been touched on today that uh, um, in some ways neuroscience and uh, the, the, the sort of latest findings are taking us beyond some of the older thinking. So I want to start by reading um, a scripture. And you'll, you'll all recognize this. This is um, it's from Luke 15. And it's the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the youngest son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. 
I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. That's moving, isn't it? He was lost. And is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fan calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now I've read all of that out <laughs> with difficulty because uh, you know, it just gets me every time. Um, and I see this as behind the parable of the sower, perhaps, you know, the most important story that Jesus tells, as a, uh, not as a story of, of people who were alive, but as a, as a, as a parable, as a story of uh, representing things. And I've read it all out because I think for some people here, you, you, you maybe will see this story differently from now on as we talk about uh, these three things today. I'm going to talk about what it means to be human. I'm going to talk about what is a rock bottom. And I'm going to talk about bonded relationships with things. And when I studied this this week to sort of do this talk, as I say, I, I don't normally uh, give this talk. Um, it, it really surprised me and, and I've just loved doing it because um, of how much, I mean, we all know the word is so rich, don't we? But to see what's in it um, from, from the perspective of recovery uh, has been an amazing journey for me this week. So let's make a start. Um, uh, we've read that out. Let's look at uh, these three things. So starting with uh, the first one. Move, move on, thank you. Uh, the reason I want to look at this is because one of the first things we do when we, when we encounter difficulties like addiction is look at separate and separation. Um, and what I'm saying is that so much more uh, connects us than separates us. I mean, one of the big factors that I give in, in my workshop is the idea that, statistically speaking, addicts relapse at exactly the same level that everyone else does. If, you know, if you look at epileptics or anyone who has to take medicine every day, anyone who has to do everything, something every day because of a condition or a difficulty, <laughs> The statistics of the failing to do that are exactly the same as addict statistics. You might not be aware of that, but it's quite a surprising statistic when we think about difference. Are you following me there? There's, there's no difference. In, in other words, addicts relapse because they're human beings, not because they're addicts. So I want to look at connect, connectedness and the idea of what it means to be human. Um, 
And I, I would go straight back to Genesis here. Genesis 1, uh, 27, 28, where uh, God says, let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness, so that he may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. It's the idea that we're made in God's image. And I don't know about you sometimes when you read that, it's quite, it's quite challenging, isn't it? You know, let us make man in our own image. Does that strike you? You know, this, I'm not a theologian, you know, but the theologians tell us that it's the fact that God is multifaceted uh, that shows us that he is the creator. And, you know, and the other things that are just made up by men, called gods, are unities. They're, they're one thing. And this means that they're not the creator. It's sort of a, a massively important thing for reasons that are too complicated for me to explain to you. But it's this idea that we know of God as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Even though we might say the Trinity is never actually mentioned in the Bible. Um, and... One of the things that uh, maybe to think about, uh, which I've kind of imagined, is the idea that maybe the Trinity isn't mentioned in that way because we only know the three of them. Maybe there's more. Maybe there's things we don't know. You know, we don't know everything, right? We don't see everything. So the idea that um, we are made in God's image means that we are little creators in the way that he's the, he's the creator. And the way that he makes us autonomous in the sense of uh, we, get an, um, we get to choose our life, we get to choose what we believe, we get to choose whether to return to him or not and so on. We also have an imagination that is autonomous so we, because we're made in his image. So our imagination is also autonomous. And this has got to do with the way addiction can, can start. Because our minds, you know, we wouldn't have poetry, we wouldn't have philosophy, we wouldn't have mathematics, we wouldn't have anything like that if we didn't have an imagination. And that imagination was not autonomous. So I think this is uh, very challenging. And although I, I absolutely acknowledge that there is a difference between uh, the addict brain and the normal brain, it's a big part of my approach to think about and talk about that difference. I think what connects us is, is more important. And the fact that we as human beings are multifaceted has got to be taken into account. You know, I, I always say that uh, when I'm teaching this stuff, I always say, look, when you say I, that's a complex statement. You know, it's just shorthand. I did this, I did this, I feel like this, I feel like... It's just shorthand. When we think about ourselves in any serious way, uh, you know, I would say any treatment of addiction that doesn't take into account the idea of our multifaceted self is going to fall short. In this story that we've just read out, um, there's an amazing moment. We're going to talk about rock bottoms uh, in the next section, but... You'll see that, it, I don't know if you've, you've seen that as a rock bottom, but it's certainly how I would define it. It says in the Bible, it says, when he came to his senses. What does that mean? I mean, it, it, a lot of versions say when he, come, when he came to himself, which is a bit more bizarre. The Wycliffe version uh, is very interesting. Uh, it says, uh, and he turned again to himself. And you, so you've got to ask yourself, which, which he is turning to which? Who's turning to who here? If it's just I, right? If I is just a simple idea, then who's turning to who here? Did you ever say, oh, I'm in two minds about that? Did you ever say that? Did you ever argue with yourself? More seriously, did you ever do something you decided not to do? Addiction drives people crazy, you know, and I, I work with families, I work with relatives of people who addict, and I say, look, addiction will drive you crazy, and the more rationally you try and approach it, the quicker it will drive you crazy. 
the more, you, the more sense you try and make of it, you know. When I, when I see somebody on my couch and they say, you know, I'm going crazy, I'm going mad because I keep saying I'm not going to do this and then I say, you know, what, I'm saying I'll never do that again. That's it, I, I went up to the church, I got prayed over, I got, you know, I got moved, I got, and, and that's it, finished. And then an hour later, I'm doing it again. This would drive anybody mad if they saw themselves as a unity. But if they understood themselves in a more complex way, suddenly it starts to make sense. I explain it to them this way. I say, look, you have an opinion on something. I can have a different opinion, can't I? Yes. So there's two opinions from two different parts. That's what's happening. There is a part of you that doesn't agree with what you're saying. Part of you is saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. And another part's going, no chance, mate. I don't agree with that, right? The question is, who's in the driving seat, is the question. But first of all, we have to get over this hurdle of the multifaceted self. Okay, I want to show you uh, a spectrum. I want you to imagine a spectrum. And on that spectrum, at the extreme end, I want you to put PTSD and dissociative disorder and complex PTSD and and, and this kind of difficulty right over here, okay? We understand a lot more about these things now, all right? Which I'll, I'll, maybe I'll say a little bit about, but come to the other end of the spectrum and we've got these, we've got, we've got people saying, I'm in two minds. We've got people saying, well, you know, I, I, I'm not sure about that. You know, we all remember Paul writing the Bible, why do I do these things that I don't want to do, all right? Why do I keep saying I'll do this? And why, why don't I stop doing what I say I will do? And all that kind of stuff, right? Addiction, for me, falls in the middle of the spectrum. Where there is what we call a triggering of a part. But it's not at the extreme end of the spectrum, generally speaking. Where someone is frozen. Where talking therapy doesn't work. Where we need to do something different. One of the things we've learned about trauma, um, you know, if you go back to the First World War or something like that, we they used to call it shell shock, right? It's a very simplistic view. People had been in that environment and they came out. I remember uh, as a child, you know, I was looked after a lot by my uh, Auntie Sally and my Uncle Johnny, and he'd been in the war. I don't quite know what war it was, but I know this. I have no memory of his voice. I was looked after by, by them a lot. I don't think he ever spoke in my presence. I don't think he ever said a word. We used to call that shell shock, right? What we understand now about trauma is that trauma is not quantitative. It's not measured by how loud the bombs went off or what happened to you. It's, it's measured by your, the effect it had on you. I was watching a, a, a YouTube recently of a, of a big media star who's stopped drinking and says, oh, you don't need God and you don't need AA and you don't need treatment and psychiatry and therapy. All you need is this drug. Just take this, I can't even remember what it's called. You take this drug and it takes away all the desire for alcohol and that's all you need. And what she was saying was very interesting to me. She said, you know, I get it, you know, they're all struggling and stuff, but I had a good childhood. I, my child was fine, no problem at all. I just need this drug to help me take that desire to drink away. Now, 20 years ago, I would have accepted that. You know, because that's somebody's story that they're telling me. But today, I'm not so sure. I don't think it would take me long to sit down with that person and find where things had happened in her past that her brain had registered as threatening that her brain had taken a snapshot of those things and said, I'm going to keep that snapshot in that place that's called the amygdala where, where it's stored and it isn't processed into memory. And the brain keeps constant vigilance for anything that matches that snapshot. And when it does, you get triggered. So this is the idea of... Um, of how 
we are to understand the human condition uh, in, that, in that idea of, of addiction. It's, I see it in the middle of that spectrum um, and I approach the, the thing this way and have a great deal of effectiveness with it. So, what do we see in this story? You know, the Bible tells me that Satan is wandering around like a roar, roaring lion, seeing who he can devour. That means vulnerability, it means weak, you know, difficulty. And the first thing I see in the story is isolation, which is a big factor. Anyone who's worked in treatment centers knows isolation is, is a big factor. But what we know today is that isolation is even worse than we thought it was. We, we always knew it was bad. But the neuroscience now is showing us that it's, it's a disaster. And what, do, what did we see in the first bit of the story? He, he comes to his father and he says, divide up the inheritance, give me my share now. I get the feeling he wasn't discussing that with anybody. I don't know about you. I don't think he was chatting that over with friends and they were saying, yeah, yeah, go on, go to your dad and ask him. Isolation, I think that was rolling around his head for a long time. And then he, he came and he asked about it. And the idea of um, thoughts being entertained. The way I think about it is like this. Oh, see that's 20 minutes already. I'm gonna do that again now. I'm gonna try and stay disciplined. <laughs>